Greetings from Brother Stephan. I'm a disciple and witness of Jesus Christ to all the inhabitants of the earth. I present to you as a witness the gospel of the kingdom. In this lesson today, titled The Parable of the Wicked Tenants, we will be going over Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. This parable is also recorded in Mark and Luke, but we will not be going over those subsections of scriptures because they do not add anything more than the parable recorded in the book of Matthew. Also, um, the previous lesson that we did was the parable of the two sons. This is a continuation of that parable, but it's dealing with the second son. Also, if you have not read this parable, I suggest you read it first, because as I go through this parable, I'm going to be explaining some of the things in the parable so that you know what the parable is really referring to. Last but not least, I always suggest to anybody tuning in to this YouTube channel that you start at the very bottom of this YouTube channel with the very first rip at, with the very first video and you work your way up to the top. It is like climbing a ladder. Um, it is precept upon precept. It is like growing in Christ. Everything in previous videos prepare you for the next video. So if this is one of the first times you're tuning into this video, there's a lot of things you're probably just not going to understand. So again, beginning at Matthew chapter 21, verse 33, he says, Here another parable. There was a certain householder. Now this term householder has appeared in two other parables that we have um, taught in previous Bible studies. That first parable is the parable of the weeds, um, which we title the parable of the tares when we cover Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. That verse reads, So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not you sow good seeds in your field? From hence then have the tares. Um, and again, in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, the parable of the vineyard workers, verse 1 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder. This term householder, if you translate it to a modern day English, it is a landowner or landlord. And this particular parable is referring to a person that rents land. The person that rents the land in this parable is Christ. Christ is the creator of the heavens and the earth. The earth is his. He temporarily rents the land out to people. So this parable of the wicked tenants is not just referring to the Pharisees, but it is referring to all wicked tenants among the face of the earth. All hypocrites, all those people that do not obey the uh, rules and regulation or terms of the agreement. So again, here another parable. There's a certain householder. Again, this householder is the landlord of the earth, which is Jesus Christ, which planted a vineyard and hedged it around about and did the wine press in it and built a tower. Now Christ, in this parable, is referring to the parable of the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1-7. through seven. This subsection of scripture is known as the song of the vineyard. And we're going to be going over this subsection of scriptures so we can clearly understand what the vineyard means within the parable. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved have a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, and this fenced it is referring to the hedge it around about from the parable in Matthew of the wicked tenants. He says, and gathered out all the stones thereof and planted it with choice vines. And again, this choice vines represent the most excellent domestic grapes. Again, we go over this subsection of scripture in detail. In the study titled, The Vineyard of Yohei Bape is the House of Israel. 
So if you want more information concerning this particular subsection of scriptures, um, you have to go back to that study. He says, and built a tower in the midst of it and made a wine press therein. Again, um, this is in the study of the wicked tenants. It states, and did a wine press in it. So when you go down to verse 7 in Isaiah chapter 5, it lets you know exactly what the vineyard represents in the parable. It says, for the vineyard of yod heh vav of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Yehuda, his pleasant plant. And again, the reason I have the word Yehuda here, because, because it is the original word from the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. The word Judah, or Jew, does not exist. It is completely made up. It is not in the Greek nor Hebrew manuscripts. Almost every name, beginning with the J in the King James Version Bible, is completely made up. These names are not translated. They are just simply made up. So from Judah to Jesus to Jacob, Jerusalem, um, Joseph, these were not the original names in the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. So now... We discuss who the householder is. We defined the vineyard. We're going to continue with the parable. Um, it says he planted a vineyard and he has did a roundabout and did the wine press in it and built a tower therein and let it out to husbandsmen. And his or let it out is just referring to rented it or leased it out to husbandmen. Now, if you have been following the YouTube channel, you already know that a husbandman is a minister. We're going to have a quick review so that you can understand um, what husbandmen mean in this parable. If you go to John chapter 15, verses 1 to 2, this is when Jesus gives a parable of himself being a true vine. He says, I am the true vine. This means he is the main roots and trunk of the tree that absorbs water from the ground that feeds the rest of the branches. He says, and my father is the husbandman. Now this word husbandman, when you translate it back to Greek, it comes from a Greek word, georgias. And when you translate that word georgias to a modern day English, it means like a farmer or gardener or a tiller of the ground. So from here, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-9. through 9. Again, the subsection of scripture is called Paul and Apollos, God's fellow workers. Um, so in other words, if God is a husbandman, Paul and Apollos are his fellow husbandmen. They're farmers, gardeners. Verse 5 says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers. And again, in previous study, we defined this word ministers in detail, um, particularly the study titled, uh, one second, let me pull the study up for you, the study, which is greatest? I'm sorry, I should have did this before the video but I don't want to leave any good information out so if you go back to um, the study So if you go back to the study titled, Which is Greater, we go over exactly what it means to be a minister. And in that study, we talked about how a minister is really a waiter. God the Father prepares the food. The waiter is the one that goes to the food to get the food that God prepared and deliver it 
or to the people waiting to eat. Waiters does not prepare the food. They deliver whatever God the Father cooks. So again, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But waiters, they just simply serve the food by whom ye believe or by whom you eat. Even as the Lord gives every man, I have planted Apollos water. In other words, they are fellow workers in the vineyard, husbandmen, farmers. Theos, which is God of God, give the increase. So then neither is he that plant anything, neither is he that water anything, but God of God that give the increase. Now, he that plant and he that water is one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And this labor is referring to um, the labor that he does um, or the work that he does in the vineyard. For we are laborers. And again, these are laborers in the vineyard to gather with God. You are God's husbandry. So not only is God the husbandman, but we work with God by allowing God to work through us. And the um, and by God working through us, He it is what how we um, prune the vines, uh, minister the gospel to the sheep, um, take care of the vineyard. So again, we're just going over what does um, husbandman mean in this parable. And in the parable, it is referring to people that has the spirit of God to do God's will. And God's will is that none should perish, but that all should have the gift of of eternal life so he sent ministers to people to the house of Israel to try to prune them to teach them to let them know that they have to repent and they must bear the proper fruit so again we are still on um, within verse 33 and again it states he let it out to husbandmen and again that word let is just referring to rented or leased it out to husbandmen. And we just went over the term husbandmen. And it says, and went into a far country. So now we're going to discuss what it means to go into a far country in this parable. Now, if you go to Matthew chapter 15, verses 14 through 30, the parable of the talents, verse 14, um, also use similar terminology. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. And in this parable, we already explained what traveling into this far country means. If he Asus is the householder, traveling into a far country represents his ascension. So if you go to Mark chapter 16, verses 19 through 20, this subsection of scripture is known as the ascension. It reads, just give me one second here. And it reads, so then, after the Lord had spoken unto him, he was received up into heaven. Being received up into heaven is basically what it means when it says he went into a far country or was traveling into a far country and sat on the right hand of God. Now, there's been a lot of talk lately about the right hand of God um, on basically on YouTube and a lot of people are really hung up on what it means that Christ sat on the right hand of God and Christ sitting on the right hand of God means that Christ is an indispensable helper or chief assistant of God the Father. Christ is not God the Father. He's God the Father's chief assistant. In simple modern day terminology, we will say he's God's the Father right hand man. And this is why Christ is called the um, Allah Shepherd. In other words, his chief assistant. So now we have verse 34. And it says, And when the time of the fruit drew near. So to help you understand what it means when the time of the fruit drew near, 
Uh, we're going to go back to the study titled Bath Phage, um, where we cover Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22, when Jesus curses the fig tree. If you go to Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 14, it says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. In other words, to find any fruit, any figs to eat. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. So in other words, when you in the study titled Bath Phage, when we finished that study, we kind of didn't close it out because you really cannot understand uh, why Christ cursed the fig tree until you get to about the 24th chapter of Matthew. So by the time we get to the 24th chapter of Matthew, you will completely understand and understand um, this parable of the fig tree from Matthew chapter 21, verse 18 through 22. Uh, and speaking of Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 32 through 35, um, this, we, this, this subsection of scripture is titled as the lesson of the fig tree. It says, now learn the parable of the fig tree. When the branches is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So this kind of like when Christ called the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, ye hypocrites. You can discern the times of the sky. You can forecast the weather, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. So this when the time of the fruit drew near, he's talking about discerning the signs of the time. So when you go back to the uh, bath phage, uh, for the time of the figs was not yet. He said, the signs of the time is not yet. Summer is not near. Verse 33 says, so likewise, when you see all these things, and all these things that he's referring to is everything in Matthew chapter 24 before you get to this lesson of the fig tree. And that's why I say you won't completely understand um, until we get to Matthew chapter 24. But uh, Matthew chapter 24 Lay out the fruit of the fig tree. So it say, likewise, when you see all these things, when you see the fruit of the fig tree on the fruit, know that is near. And what is near? That time is at hand. That Christ is about to make his second coming. Even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass to all these things be fulfilled. And it says, um, again at verse 34 he says and when the time of the fruit drew near so right when the time of the fruit is drawn, drawing near any time God is about to do something drastic he sent his servants to warn the people like Yonah he's going to send servants prophets preachers teachers just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah He's going to give people a chance to repent first. So again, verse 34, when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his prophets. Again, the word say here is his servants, but I just have prophets here uh, because that's what servants represents. It represents the prophets, the people or messengers, the people that um, God the Father sent as husbandmen to warn the other people. So in this particular parable, the servants are prophets, and they are going to the husbandmen, those that are already in the vineyard, people that are supposed to be ministers in the house of Israel. Now, these husbandmen in this parable, the bad husbandmen, is referring to the Levitical priesthood. It is referring to the priesthood that was first sent into the vineyard. So if you go back to the parable of the vineyard workers, the first um, minister that was called into the work, into the um, um, house of Israel, into the vineyard to work, was the Levitical priesthood. Um, if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, um, it says, And gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. So again, these servants could be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Um, back to the parable, it says, for they might receive the fruits of it. Now we're going to go over um, what does it really mean? What are the real fruits of the vineyard? Uh, before we get into the real fruits of the vineyard, um, I want to discuss a little bit more in detail in parable form what the fruits of the vineyard is. Then we will get into scriptures to let you know what these fruits is in real life. Now, the fruits of the, in the parable, the fruits of the vineyard represents that rent that has to be paid for leasing out the land. Just like if you had an apartment or a house today that you rented from a landlord, it is the tenant's regular payment to the landlord for the use of the land or house or apartment or property. Um, so to dig into the fruits of it, uh, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 19 verses 9 through 18. This subsection of scripture is known as love your enemies. It says, and when ye reap your harvest. Again, this harvest represents the harvest and vineyard means the same thing of your land. Now, remember, this land is the land that your hey, Bob, hey, give to you, lease to you, loan to you, let you use. It says, ye shall not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shall you gather the gleanings. Gleanings just mean collecting the extra leftover crops from farmer fields after you have harvested it. In other words, if you harvest the field, whatever falls on the ground, leave it. Don't pick it up. Don't collect it. Neither the, reap the corners. Verse 10 says, And ye shall not glean your vineyard, neither shall ye gather every grape of your vineyard. In other words, leave the corner. And what falls on the ground when you're harvesting, ye shall leave them for the poor and stranger. So, going back to the parable, it says that ye might receive the fruits of it. The fruits of the vineyard, the payment, is to give to the poor and the stranger. To make sure they eat. I am your Tebafe, your Elohim. So from, from here, I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. This subsection of scripture is known as generosity in lending and giving. Verse 7 says, If there be among you a poor man of one of your brethren within your gates, in your land, which your Hebafe Elohim leased to you, give you, we're still talking about the same thing. We're explaining this in the parable form so you can get it. In the land which your Hebafe rent to you, ye shall not harden thine heart, nor shed thine hand. From your poor brother, but ye shall open thy hands wide unto him, and shall surely lend him sufficient um, for his need, and that which he want. Beware that there be not a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year of the harvest of release is at hand. In other words, he's talking about making excuses, any excuses, not to give to your poor brother. And thine eye be evil, that means you have wicked thoughts in your mind against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry unto your Tebafe against you, and it be sin unto you. Ye shall surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when you give unto him, because for this thing your Tebafe, your Elohim, will bless you in all the works and in all that you put thy hands unto. Now, when this scripture says that he will bless you in all of thy works and in all that you put your hand to, it is talking about the work that is done in the vineyard, in the harvest. The work that you do for the body of Christ. Then he will bless your hand. This is not prosperity doctrine. Because as he bless your hands, you're going to grow more crops. Grow more food, and guess what's going to happen? More poor people are going to come in. The scriptures say, if wealth increase, if food increase, those that eat increase. Verse 11 says, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command you, saying, he shall open 
thy hand wide unto your brother, unto the poor and your needy um, in your in your land. And again, in the vineyard. Um, another thing I just want to explain. Um, these scriptures that we're going over in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, these are basically like the least agreement between the landlord and the husbandman. So within that lease agreement, he's telling the husbandman what to do with the crops in the field, what to do with the grapes, what to do with the rest of the harvest. This is part of that lease agreement. So when you go to Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 11 through 20, it says, Beware that you forget not your Hebafe, your Elohim. Don't forget the terms and conditions of the lease. In keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day. And those are the things we just went over here in um, Deuteronomy 15 and Leviticus chapter 19. Um, least when you have eaten and are full and have built goodly houses and dwell therein. In other words, when you have you have gotten rich off the land. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and you forget your Tebaf, hey, your Elohim. You don't want to keep the terms and conditions of the lease agreement anymore. You got puffed up. You want to keep everything for yourself. You want to you want to come up with your own um, lease agreement. Verse 17 says, and say in thine heart, my power and my might is of mine hand have gotten me this wealth. In other words, you've forgotten um, that it is um, that this that this property that this land belonged to your Hebaphe, your Elohim, and he the one allowed you to lease the property. Verse eighteen says, but ye shall remember your Hebaphe, your Elohim, for it is he. They give you power to get wealth. It is not by our own hands or our own power that we get wealth. It is only by the power of your Hebaphe, your Elohim. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. Again, we're still talking about what it means in the parable, the fruits of the spirit. I mean, the fruits of it. When he coming to get the fruits of the vineyard. So we discussed it, the fruits of the vineyard in parable form. Now we're going to get into what these fruits mean in real life. When you go to Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 23. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So in other words, these fruit that he was requiring um, for the ministers of the vineyard is to love everybody, to share everything, to enjoy everything with everybody, to live in peace with everybody, to be long-suffering, gentle, good to everybody. And then scripture says, against such there is no law. So in other words, against people who think like this, who put love, joy, peace, long-suffering, there is no lease agreement. And there's no lease agreement because you live above the lease agreement. If you was to be renting out an apartment and they said your walls can only get so dirty, in this in, in in your lease agreement with your landlord but your standard of cleanliness is higher than his standard of cleanliness then you are not under any agreement you're under no law because your standard is much higher than his standard when you go to ephesians chapter 5 verses 9 it says for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. These, this is the type of fruit that the Lord of the vineyard is looking for. It's in all goodness, in all righteousness and truth. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 says that ye might walk worthily 
of the Lord unto all pleasing. And again, all pleasing, not falling short in some areas, not committing sin here and there. This says all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And again, that knowledge of God is increasing in truth. This is what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, in all goodness, in all righteousness, in all truth, walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Philippians chapter 1 verse 11 adds, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. So again, if you go back to the parable of the true vine, he says, I am the true vine. I'm the main roots and the trunk that absorbs the water. And my father is the husbandman. So in other words, you don't get water, that holy water, unless your branch is connected to the true vine. Being filled with all fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. If you're not connected to them roots and that vine, which is Jesus Christ, you it is impossible to produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. You cannot do it unless you're connected to Jesus Christ. We go back, it says, for the laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandmen. And again, um, God uses um, his husbandmen, um, which is his farmers, his laborers, um, to help prune the vineyard. They take away undesirable leaves. They take away undesirable fruit. Matter of fact, if you just go back to um, where Philippians chapter uh, 1, if you go back to verse 2 in John 15, it says, Every branch in me that um, produce um, not fruit, he taketh away. That means he cut it off and he cast it into the fire. He used it to um, heat up the stove, to cook, um, to provide heat to the house or something like that. And it says, in every branch in me that bears, which means produce fruit, he purge it. And uh, purge it means he removed the unwanted leaves or fruit, that it may bring forth more fruit. So in other words, um, I try to explain this again really quickly. Christ is the true vine and the trunk. God the Father is the ones that provide the roots with water. Christ, or the roots, absorbs the water. The water go up through the main trunk, which is Jesus Christ. And that water that comes out of Jesus Christ, or through Jesus Christ, is how the branches get water in order to bear fruit. If this branch don't get any water, it cannot bear fruit. That water comes from God. Now these branches that are connected to Christ, any undesirable fruit that it produces, it is the job of ministers to remove that fruit. And that fruit, that bad fruit represents sin. The purpose of a minister is to say, hey, you're doing something that God does not permit. You have to stop doing it and repent. You remove the bad fruit from the vine, from the branch, so that the good fruit that's on the branch can get more water and grow faster, bigger, stronger, and produce even more fruit. Um, so from here, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6, verses 22. It says, but now, being made free from sin, you have become a servant of God. And again, the servants is ministers. Um, go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. It is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But the main thing I want to point out, it says, but now being made free from sin, you become a servant. Elohim does not have one apostle, one prophet, one evangelist, one pastor, one teacher that is still living in sin. You must be free from sin and bear the fruit of the spirit. Know how to purge your own self and keep bad fruit and leaves out of your own heart.
before you can do it to somebody else. So this again, this doctrine that these hypocrites teach in church, you are always going to live in sin. What they saying is you always going to bear bad fruit, even if you are connected to the true vine. That is false doctrine, and it is an abomination of desolation. You cannot bear sinful fruit and be connected to Jesus Christ. God give his water to purge you. He send husbandmen to purge you. He give you the ability to purge yourself. If you're still bearing bad fruit, that branch is going to be cut off of the vine. Um, we have verse 35 in the parable of the wicked tenants. It says, and the husbandmen. Now again, the husbandmen in this parable is referring to the Levitical priesthood. Um, the Levitical priesthood just basically mean those um, chief priests and pastors. It's referring to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and it is referring to those that follow the Pharisees and Sadducees, which the scriptures today with the scriptures call hypocrisy. So if you are a hypocrite, you are one of these husbandmen. If you're one of those people that keep the Levitical, try to keep the Levitical law, the Levitical priesthood law, which is the law of Moses. This is talking about those type of people who try to place themselves under the old covenant. Hypocrisy. So it says, and the husbandmen, again, the hypocrites, the people under the old covenant, they took his servant. And again, just in case you're confused, you say, what servant? Um, if you go back up to, it says that um, he sent his servant, again, his prophets, unto the husbandmen. And the husbandmen, which is the Levitical priesthood, that second son from the uh, last study of the two sons, they took his servant. Again, this is a servant of God, or the, uh, the, the apostle, the preacher. And it said, and they beat one and killed another and stoned another. So now we're going to uh, go over some scriptures so you know what this parable is really talking about. If you go to Matthew chapter 23, verses 30 through 33, it says, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers of them um, in the blood of the prophets. And this blood of the prophets somehow beat one, killed another, stoned another. So if you go to 2 Chronicles, if you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 17 through 22, this is the wickedness of Yoash. Verse 20 says, And the spirit of Elohim came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehadiah, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith Elohim, Why transgress you the commandments of yod heh bav -Hey, that ye cannot prosper? So most people say, uh, we are, What does he mean? Why do you transgress the commandments of yod heh bav -Hey, that you cannot prosper? We just went over those. We just went over that in Leviticus, Deuteronomy chapter 15 and Deuteronomy 8. It's talking about why do you not keep the terms and conditions of the least so that you prosper. Elohim said, if you keep the terms and condition, I will bless you and you will produce even more. So Zechariah is saying, why do you transgress the terms and conditions of the least? Why is it that when you reap the harvest, you still reap the corners of the field and gather the gleaning? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 15, it says, If there be among you a poor man of one of your brethren within um, your gates in your land, which your Tebafe, your Elohim, give you, you shall open thine, hand, open thine heart. Um, you shall not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from your poor brother, but ye shall open thine hands wide unto him, and shall surely lend him sufficient for his need and that which he wants. So Zechariah said, why do you transgress 
this commandment. Why have you, why is it that in your heart you think it is by your power and your might and by your hand have gotten you wealth? Why have you forgotten your Hebafe, your Elohim? Why have you forgotten that it is He that gives you power to get wealth? Because you have forsaken your Hebafe, and and have and He have also forsaken you. And they conspired against Him and stoned Him with stones, at the commandment of the king, in the court of the house of your Hebafe. So again, we're going over scriptures to explain what it means in the parable that the husbandman took the servant and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And an example of that is in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 17 to 22. Uh, we're going to jump back to Matthew chapter 23. We have verse 31. It says, Wherefore ye be witnesses against yourselves. In other words, they're witnesses against themselves because they call these murderers that um, beat kill and stone the prophets their fathers so they're confessing that they're their children it says that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets fill ye up then the measures of your fathers <coughs> verse 33 says serpents in other words he's calling them devils generation of vipers he's calling them the children of the devil how can you escape the damnation of hell wherefore Behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Now what Christ is referring to here is that after he depart, after he's ascended up into the heavens, that these hypocrites are still going to be persecuting God's messengers, God's servants, from the time that Christ leave until the time of his second coming. If you go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 14, this is witnesses to all nations. Verse 9 says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. This is part of the fruit that is going to be produced on the fig tree. And the scriptures say, when ye see these fruit, know that it is time, even at the door. When you go to Revelations chapter 13 and 7, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, God's servants, and to overcome them. This overcome them means to afflict them and kill them. It says, And power was given um, him over all families and tongues and nations. In other words, it said, And ye shall be hated of all nations. Everybody else is going to hate the saints of God and afflict and kill them. And it's talking about and persecute from city to city, scourge them. So again, this is just talking about from the time of Christ's ascension until his second coming, that the body of Christ will suffer tribulations at the hand of hypocrites and devil worshipers. Verse 35 says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed from the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Verashias, whom ye, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So again, this is going to happen from the generations, from the time of Christ's ascension until his second coming. And one of the main things that I want to point out here, the blood. That was shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel until the very last saint that dies during the great tribulation period is going to be on the hands of every last hypocrite. Back to Matthew chapter 21 verses 33 to 46, the parable of the wicked tenant. We have verse 36. He says again, he sent two other servants more Then the first. And they did unto him likewise. So if you go to Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, a good example of that in the New Testament is the beheading of Yachanan. It says, and he, he is referring to Herod, sent and beheaded Yachanan in prison. And his head was brought in a charger and given unto a damsel, and she brought it unto her mother. 
when you go to Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, the subsection of scripture is known as um, Lament over Jerusalem. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killed the prophets and stoned them, which are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered your children together? In other words, he's talking about receive that fruit. Receive the fruit of the Spirit, love from you, joy from you, peace with you. Taught you the word of God. He says, even as hens gather her chickens under her wings. In other words, to protect them, to lead them, to guide them. And you would not. In other words, you would not follow. We back at the parable in verse 37. It says, but last of all, he sent them his son. Now the son is referring to Jesus. Saying, they will reverence my son. They will respect their fear, my only begotten son. But then the husbandmen, again, this husbandmen are ministers of the Levitical priesthood. These are people under the law of Moses. This is why people under the old covenant reject the new covenant. Hypocrites. They saw the son. They said among themselves, this is the heir. This is the one who's going to inherit all things. He's going to inherit this vineyard. He's going to inherit the kingdom of God. From the great nows in Egypt to the great Euphrates. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And again, this is the parable. Um, if you go to John chapter 11, verses 45 through 57. Um, you can read about the plot to kill Jesus. Verse 48 says, um, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Again, this still represents that inheritance. All men will believe on him. They wanted the people. They wanted the fruit of the people. The fruit of the people do not belong to man. It belongs to God. It says, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. So again, um, the scripture helps you to understand um, the minds and heart of hypocrites. It says, and they caught him. Now this caught him is referring to Jesus' betrayal and arrest. If you go to Mark chapter 14, verses 43 to 42, it says that immediately while he yet spake, came Judas, one of the twelve, with him a great multitude with swords and stives. Stives are wooden shackles from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, the same as he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he um, was come, he goeth straightway to Jesus and said, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid hands on him and took him. They caught him. It says, and they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard. In other words, um, the vineyard, when you read the scriptures, is it's the city of David. The city of David is the Garden of Eden. It is like the throne of the planet. It is the center of the earth. Well, not the center of the earth. The center of the um, land that is on uh, the face of the earth. So if you go to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 12, it says, Wherefore, Jesus also, um, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, um, suffered without, this means outside the gate, this means outside the city, outside the city walls, outside of the vineyard, outside the city of David. If you go to Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 to 34, um, the subsection of scriptures known as crucifixion, gives a name to that place. It says, and then they will come to a place called Calvary. Um, Calvary and um, Golgoth means the same thing. It's a, uh, it means, um, and it says that is to say the place of the skulls. And again, this place was outside the city of David. And then it says, um, they cast him out of the vineyard and they slew him. And it slew means they crucified him. Uh, verse 40 says, and when the Lord, now verse 40 says this, when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard, so when Jesus, the landlord, the owner, 
the king of the house of Israel, come, what will he do unto those husbandmen? In other words, the farmers, the hypocrites, the people who reject the New Testament um, and say they still believe in the Old Testament. What is he going to do to those hypocrites? What is he going to do to those murderers? Verse 41, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. If you go to Revelations chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, um, for, in that subsection of scriptures, verse 6 says this, And in those days shall men, these are those hypocrites, seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Christ also says this in the New Testament. He said, It shall be more tolerable in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah than for them. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, they died immediately, vanished, turned into pillars of salt. When Jesus returns, they're going to suffer. They're going to seek death. They're going to seek, they're going to want to commit suicide and not be able. And again, if you go back to the study, Christ coming judgment. We go over Christ's coming judgment in detail. If you go to Romans chapter 9, verse 27, it says, Jesus also cried concerning Israel. So, Ye, so um, um, Eli, Ye, Elijah also cried concerning Israel. He said, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, God keepeth his, keep his promise to Abraham. His seed shall be like the sand of the sea. If any man can count the sand, shall they be able to also number your seed. But it says this, only a remnant shall be saved. Very few shall be saved. So most people who brag about being an Israelite, they don't understand. Only a few shall be saved. And again, we go over this in detail in a study titled, The Vineyard of yod is the House of Israel. And it says, so he will miserably destroy those wicked tenants. He will, he will remove the sinners and hypocrites and will rent it out or lease it, um, the vineyard out unto husbandmen or ministers or people which shall render him the fruits in their season. In other words, they're going to keep the lease agreement. They're going to live above the lease agreement. They're going to produce those choice bonds that the vineyard was supposed to produce from the beginning. Verse 42 says, Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? In other words, Christ was letting them know, since they kept the old covenant, that who do you think this stone is that the builders reject? It lets you know that Israel was going to reject the stone. You all that are under the old covenant are rejecting the stone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is a marvelous in your eyes. And again, we go over this subsection of scripture in detail in the study titled A House on a Rock when we cover Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And again, verse 43, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God, again, which is Eden scientifically known as the fertile crescent. It says, shall be taken from you and given to a nation being, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And we explain what the kingdom of God is um, in the study title, Explaining Eden, the Kingdom of God. Verse 44 says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. If you go to Daniel chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, this is when Daniel was interpreting the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 35 says, Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken into pieces. In other words, this statue was broken into pieces and became like shaft. It was grind into power on the summer threshing floors, and the wind 
carried the powder away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image, that stone that the builders rejected, became a great mountain. And again, we go over this in detail in a study titled Purifications of the Nations. So if you want more about uh, the stone, um, that shall be, um, again, whosoever shall fall upon the stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it fall, it shall grind into powder. If you want uh, more details about that uh, scripture, go back to the study, Purifications of the Nation. We explain it in detail. Verse 45 says, And when the chief priests, and these chief priests are Ananias and Sapphira, but we'll get to that later in scriptures, um, the high priests and the Pharisees, had heard this parable, again, the parable of the wicked tenants, they knew that he spake of them. So again, this parable again is about the Pharisees and Sadducees. It is about the hypocrites, the hypocritical church leaders and their hypocrisy. It is about those people who keep the old covenant instead of the new covenant. The Old Covenant governs behavior. The new, cover, the new Covenant governs your mind. Verse 46 says, But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took Jesus for a prophet. And this concludes this gospel.